Okay, we, we've been in 1 Peter, and um, we want to uh, make our forced foray into the book itself. And uh, it would, it would, you would think it would be wise to prove the point that this, is, this whole book is about uh, the sufferings of Christ and us being with him in that. And because it's written by Peter, who failed to do that many times when he walked with Jesus, later was deeply, deeply dealt with uh, and how he wanted to be with the Lord instead of denying the Lord. And uh, in our situations... We get into circumstances that um, where, uh, you know, people are looking down on us or attacking us or whatever. And, um, and they, but it may not be just an attack on us. It may be the sufferings of Christ so that we can enter into it with him uh, and be with him. And um, needless to say, Peter got it. He got it figured out and he wrote this whole book based on that. <clears throat> reality. And uh, so you would think that our first jump into the scriptures to show, because I told you all my sharing up to this point, that's fine. It's great. It's, it's set up. But the scriptures themselves, Peter is going to speak now. And uh, we're going to start hearing from him. And um, so you would think that I would have picked out some of the big, you know, I said this is circular and in that there are different circles in this thing and uh, that I would have picked one of the big circles to prove this. But I want to start with something simple and I want to start with uh, the idea that um, Peter got a whole lot of what he saw and what's written in his book, First Peter, uh, from the book of Psalms. But before I do that, I want to just give you that scripture and just the small portion of it. And it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, <clears throat> early on in the class last semester, I think that I had us uh, give our definition of what that meant. And... Uh, it was pretty much the nominal definition, and, and I would have given the same thing before the Lord began to open my eyes to the things he's saying here. And that is that um, there's a devil, and the devil is out to get us, and we need to be sober, and we need to be vigilant, and we need to watch out, you know. And, you know, so it's almost like, you know, first, you know, sober, we're sober. And then we're vigilant, you know, we got our karate hands up and we're ready to, to deal with this, this adversary. <clears throat> but Peter has something completely different in mind. He's, he is writing this in relationship to what we have talked about, uh, particularly the last two classes uh, where we really started digging in onto the meaning of it. And um, <clears throat> so before I get into Peter's definition of that, uh, the, the word uh, lion is only used a couple of times in the scripture, um, a few times. And um, one of those, of course, refers to Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But then everyone turns and looks and he's not a lion at all. He's a lamb. <clears throat> all right. So, um, but what I want to do is give you some of the scriptures that deals with that. And I want us to see a pattern of, of them saying basically the same thing. Okay, so <clears throat> to begin with, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16 through 18. 2 Timothy 4, verse 16 through 18. <clears throat> and um, this is Paul writing to Timothy and he's writing about the fact that when, when he was brought before the judges and brought before in, in Rome, or uh, that, that he had to give an account for what he believed and stood for and, and this sort of thing. And so he's addressing that. And he says, at my first answer, no man stood with me. Okay, so 
there, there you have Jesus being persecuted and being judged, the judgment before the crucifixion, which the sufferings of Christ relate to the judgment before the crucifixion. You have Paul going through the judgment and you have everybody forsaking him just like the disciples did. In fact, that's what it says here. No man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Okay, so that's exactly what happened with Jesus and all of the disciples except John was there. And then he says this, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge, which is the same thing as Jesus saying, you know, you know, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, Paul is recognizing that this is not just persecution. This is not just uh, people not liking my religion. This is the sufferings of Christ. Okay, so he's responding in kind to that. And, and trust me, Paul has plenty of this in his writings too, but it's strictly what 1 Peter is about, what Peter's trying to, to set forth in 1 Peter. But if you want to dig around a little more, you can find a lot of Paul recognizing this reality in uh, like Romans, uh, well, let's just say 12 through 15. Uh, all through there. 14 is, but it's, it gets bogged down in worshiping idols and stuff like that. So maybe 12 and then skip 14 and, and 15. <clears throat> anyway, um, so here he is. He's, he's in a situation and he's recognizing that this isn't just hard times or people being mean or, you know, unfair things going on here. He recognizes it. And by, by recognizing it, he says, you know, no one stood with me. They all forsook me, just like what happened on Jesus on the cross. And I pray that it won't be laid to their charge, just like the Lord. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> verse 17, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Okay. He, now this isn't, this isn't the devil going to attack him. The mouth of the lion represents those who, and we'll get into this, not tonight, but we'll get into this. Uh, may, I, may I just give you a hint under the topic of the stone, stone that was rejected. We'll get into this and, and um, we'll see that um, it, this to, to, to fellowship with Jesus in his sufferings, first of all, it can't be about your sufferings. It's his sufferings. Second of all, um, the, it, it's going to be, it's going to include people that are talking bad about you, lying, doing all this kind of stuff and that. Now, people can do that about you because you deserve it because you, you sowed enough of that yourself to get a bunch back. You're just reaping what you're sowing. Don't call that the sufferings of Christ. You know, if, if you know that you've totally shut your mouth and that you were at peace and you were with the Lord through the whole thing, then be with the Lord then. But don't, don't, you know, don't be one of those that, that is going to now start desecrating the sufferings of Christ, okay? That belongs to him, and he wants us to be with him, not lie about being with him, okay? I'm sorry. I've just got to say it the way it is. So, <laughs> so still glad you came. <clears throat> All right. Um, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, meaning that they were, they were standing there. Others were standing there. And we know that that happened at, uh, I'm trying to think of the Joppa. Is that the place where he was brought before uh, one of the magistrates there? And, uh, you know, he got to give his spiel. And another guy who was against him was really eloquent. Tertullus or something like that. <laughs> anyway, and uh, aren't you proud that you have someone so deeply knowing the scriptures? That... <laughs> anyway, it, it did happen there. And um, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, so, so he said, I'm at my first um, uh, answer where I'm giving an answer, 
but he was delivered out of the mouth of the lion of those who would have uh, tore him down. And let me just say, not just tore him down publicly or whatever, but the, the, the work of the enemy as the lion working in people to get to Jesus <clears throat> is um, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's, it is pointed at Jesus first and foremost. It's pointed at Jesus. And it is usually those who, uh, like with the enemy, the, lo the, the, the lion wants to attack your soul so that you're not with Jesus, so that you're not standing with him like Peter did in fear. And I don't know the man and all this kind of stuff. So, so, um, <clears throat> so this is the, now this is, this is the premise I'm going on tonight. So I, I want you to follow that out, that, that the basic attack of this lion is he's our, he's our adversary in that he's attacking our soul so that we will fail the Lord so that he won't get anyone standing with him so that um, uh, we'll deny the Lord. Okay? Or in this case, we'll forsake him and, um, um, and he'll have to pray for us. Father, forgive us for not being there. See, and I, that was a, that was something I was going to share fairly recently within the last uh, six months um, about uh, Jesus's responses on the cross. And um, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, he's he is um, talking about what people personally did to him or didn't do to him. He's not talking about the forgiveness of the whole world. And one day I'll get to share that and show you very definitely that that's the case. But for now, um, uh, so he says in verse 18, well, at the end of verse 17, delivered out of the mouth of the lion, verse 18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. All right. Does that word every evil work sound familiar? It's all through first Peter. And the definition of that evil work is yet to be fully discovered, but it's a big deal because it's so used. Evil, uh, you, you've got uh, evil doers, and you've got uh, evil speaking, and uh, speaking evil, and you know, you, you got a lot of that in there because it's part, part and parcel of the sufferings of Christ on the on that end of it, the enemy's end, toward him, and attacking you so that you won't be with him. Not, not in this way, not in, the, in this way. And, and one of the things that I've said, and you notice the use of the word gold, and we'll probably deal with it, but I have, I have called this, based on what I think Peter's mind is and his use of it, <clears throat> is that to be with the Lord in the sufferings of Christ is the gold standard. There's nothing higher. <clears throat> Certainly to Peter. It's the gold standard. It is... It is higher than, you know, just giving yourself as a martyr or, or, or doing a great ministry or whatever, because that, the, an example might be of that is, is Mary Bethany who gave herself to Jesus two days before he died. And, and, and everyone was talking against her and everything. And she probably knew that she's going to get a lot of flack and worse than flack. And, and um, sure enough, even the disciples are joining in and they're being the evildoers. They're being the, they're being the roaring lion that's roaring out these accusations. And she didn't run away and she didn't falter to the end. So I think that she's a, I think that situation was a clear example of the sufferings of Christ. It really wasn't about her. It was about Jesus, you know, one of them said, well, if, if Jesus knew who this was, you know. All right. <clears throat> so, um, so de shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto the heavenly kingdom to whom be glory. All right. Anybody remember the pattern? The pattern is <clears throat> that you, the, you begin to be accused. Okay. You can call that the roaring lion. 
Uh, you can call that evil doers who are accusing you, uh, but it, it's really the sufferings of Christ. And, and when we get into the big scriptures that just say it, then you'll be able to see it. But the Lord told me to start with this one. Um, then then the, there's a, you know, that person had a hope to bring God glory and to glorify Christ. So they willingly enter into that. And they do it in the right spirit. And their hope is that I will be able to withstand the roar um, of the lion, which represents the multitude or, or the evil, those who will speak evil against you, which is another phrase used over and over uh, in First Peter. Um, and, uh, but then if all of those things line up and then you go through that at the end, there's going to be this glory to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So that's Paul laying it out. This is, this is the sufferings of Christ. Um, no man stood with me. Next, all men forsook me. Next, not, don't lay this to their charge. I, next, I was not moved by the roar, the mouth of the lion. Um, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I was not moved by that. My, my soul was saved. Now, you think I'm throwing that in and da da da? No, we're going to talk about that. Okay. And, um, uh, and now he's coming out of it to whom be glory. And this is eternal or heavenly glory, not just um, earthly things that you did good, that your name's written in the, the book of good deeds. You know, <clears throat> okay. Now let's go to Revelation chapter thirteen. Revelation thirteen, <clears throat> and let's look at verse two. <clears throat> and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Okay, so, so that's what, that's exactly what we're going to see in a lot of scriptures here, that it is the deliverance from the lion and the mouth of the lion is that you don't let it get to your soul where you give up, or you faint, or you, you deny the Lord, or you whatever, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, uh, so, let's see. Give it, let's see, um, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power. Okay, so that's exactly the kind of deal this is. The dragon is giving power to the, the, the lion mouth to um, break us down and make us protect our own flesh or protect our own reputation or protect how we look or how people will think of us or all this kind of stuff instead of just being with Jesus. Okay? And guess what? The great red dragon is backing that. You think, well, he's going around and stabbing people with a sharp pointed tail or a pitchfork. No, this is the kind of stuff that he's doing, that the great red dragon is doing. All right, so, um, and, and his seat and great authority. Okay, now let's, let's go down to verse 5, and we'll read 5 through 9, still in Revelation. And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Okay, so... 42 months is a long time, folks. I mean, what is the deal with that? I mean, why is, why is the power continually given to the mouth of the lion, as it were? Why isn't it given to, um, you know, gather uh, iron and, and make, make uh, chains and put people in chains or, 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 you know, throw them in concentration camps or all this kind of stuff? I mean, it's kind of interesting to me that one of his greatest things in the book of Revelation is his mouth and trying to break down the saints. All right. So 
<clears throat> and he opened his mouth. This is verse 6, uh, Revelation 13. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. Okay. Do you, would you call that the, the sufferings of Christ? Would you call that an attack on you or him? On the Lord? This is time to be with him. This isn't time to be whining, well, why are they attacking me? And I've been good and I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't do something wrong. It's not about doing something wrong. I mean, you know, you, you need to have not done something wrong. First Peter, it's all in there. You know, if you, if, you know, don't be going through this uh, because of what you did wrong. Be with the Lord be with the Lord. <clears throat> All right. Um, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Okay. So, you know, uh, I know one thing. God is the one who gave him power to do this. Okay. He's not going to be able to do that. And there's plenty of places in the book of Revelation that show us being defeated and God allowing it. Okay. Uh, the, the two witnesses, uh, so many places. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and to overcome them and unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear to hear, let him hear. Do you have an ear to hear? Well, then let's hear 1 Peter 1.18. For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your father, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. It's the same thing. Okay, book of the written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's from Revelation 13, verse 8. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, is in 1 Peter chapter 1. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. It is that... They were given power. Uh, the enemy was given power to overcome them in the natural, but not to overcome their soul where they wouldn't be with the Lord. That's what God's after. That's why God would allow it. Why did God allow Jesus to go to the cross? For that very same thing. Because this is the gold standard to God and to Jesus and to the Holy Spirit. All right. So, uh, notice also in 1 Peter, when I read that, it says, but was manifest in these last times for you. Okay, so um, we'll eventually get to this in the first chapter, and we'll go over it. But let me just say to you that there, there is a, a lot of different words used to say the same thing when it talks about the last times or the last days, and we always think that's, well, that's at the end of, you know, the apocalypse comes and then, you know, we're living in the last days. But that's not the way Peter uses it. Peter uses this, this theme, and it's a theme throughout First Peter, where he uses these different words denoting the end of the trial, the end of the sufferings of Christ, that you have passed through it, and that there is a, a lamb that was manifest. It was foreordained before the world, but it was manifest in these last times. And Jesus had someone who stood with him. And, you know, I mean, the truth is, I think I mentioned this last class, but, but you can't withstand that without Jesus' nature in you. Okay. So Jesus is in heaven rooting for you. Who? Jesus is with you in the trial, and you're with him. Jesus is in you so that that lamb spirit can barely be manifested in these last times, and it be something that was glorious before the foundation of the world. What? A lamb slain. 
the spirit of what God is when every temporal thing, every temporal thing, I mean, think about the, the coronavirus and how, you know, you do, you, you're, you're reduced down to whatever's around you and whatever like this. But, but imagine if just uh, God just said, okay, now I'm going to only leave what's eternal. Poof. Well, all this stuff would be gone and there would only be, and it wouldn't be Jesus the Savior as most people know him. It would be the lamb that sl was slain, yes, to save him, but it would be a lamb nature that gave himself that God honored and exalted. Okay? So, we're not making a lot of progress here. Okay, so um, now let's go ahead and relook at 1 Peter 5, starting this time with verse 5. <clears throat> okay, likewise, ye, long, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Okay, so this looks like it's about submission, okay? Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Um, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Okay, so, so this sounds like uh, it's a, a, a theme of submission, and that's not what it's about. It is about being, if, if, somebody, if somebody is uh, an elder and you're younger and they're telling you what to do and you're this and that and you, you feel oppressed or whatever, uh, he's putting that in the category, and we're not supposed to be getting into this part yet, but I just want to warn you that this is not going to be what you think it is, and it wasn't what I thought it was either, uh, because he's saying, therefore humble yourself over, under the mighty hand of God. This is the hand of God letting something uh, overpower you, letting something be stronger than you, letting something uh, uh, attack you if necessary. Uh, and it'll go into wives and husbands and everything else, and it'll be the same thing. Okay, so he says, um, but be clothed with humility. In other words, have the lamb spirit, for God resists the proud. If you're going to throw that off and say, I won't, you know, this is just the devil, or this is just a bad leader, or this is just a bad, you know, husband, or whatever, and not be with the Lord in that, then he's going to resist you and you're going to, you know, he's saying, this is the mighty hand of God, humble yourself under it. Okay. Uh, that he may exalt you when? In, in due time. This is not now. This is in the latter days. This is another phrase and he uses a bunch of them and they all say the same thing. They all come to that same thing at the end where you come forth in the nature of Christ. You've, you've glorified God and you've allowed Christ to live in you and you didn't rebel against it and you didn't, you didn't just call it the devil when it was the mighty hand of God. Amen? All right. So, um, casting all your care on Him for He cares for you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Okay? Where did that come from? You know? I mean, if this was really about um, just being submissive, That'd be one thing. If this was about um, being humble, then, okay, so casting on your care, be sober, be vigilant. So he's going to say, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfastly in the faith. All right. As soon as we see the word resist the devil, we go, yeah, I rebuke you. Get behind me, Satan. I, you know, <laughs> we, go through, we go through all this um, uh, uh, gospel, the gospel's reaction to everything, which is all before the cross, instead of going by the nature of Christ to be able to deal with it. Well, where do you get that from, brother? Well, I'm not worried about it because that's what he's talking about. He says resist him in the faith. In the faith, see, this is another one. If you, wanna, if you really want to know the Lord in 1 Peter, then you need to look up the word faith and find out if it, what it's talking about because it's talking about having the kind of faith that you can go through the sufferings of Christ with him without having to stand up for yourself or cover yourself or justify or, or cry unfair or all that kind of stuff. 
<clears throat> so I said, resist him in the faith, knowing. Resist him in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren. They're going through the sufferings of Christ too. He's not saying that the devil's attacking everybody here. He's talking about submission here under, and people may not be, you know, he'll get into it more in another spot, but uh, someone who's going to be over you who may not be fair at all times. And, um, and he's saying, cast your care upon him. Don't, don't fight back. Don't, um, you know, do all that kind of stuff. Cast your care upon the Lord because he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant. This is just a roaring lion of the enemy trying to break down your soul. And he says, um, so resist that. Resist that voice. Resist that roar. Resist the, you know, in truth, it is resist your soul. I mean, we'll see that because your soul is the thing that's going to give in in this situation. All right. And he says, resist it, knowing that they're going through, others are going through it too. We're all got to go through this if we're going to glorify the Lord in this manner. All right. And he says, uh, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory. There it is again. So he's trying to get us to this eternal glory. And if you've read 1 Peter enough, you know that the pattern will always end in eternal glory. Once you've passed through that trial by the nature of Christ, there will be eternal glory, not to you, but to the Father. But, you know, you'll be glorified that He's glorified, if you will, um, who has called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that you have suffered a while. There it is. There it is. There's not going to be any eternal glory. You have to suffer with the sufferings of Christ. And that, the, the term sufferings of Christ or Christ's sufferings are used like, well, the, the word suffering is used 15 times in a small book like First Peter. And I forget if it's five times or whatever, just with, the, with that phrase, the sufferings of Christ. You are partakers of the sufferings of Christ or, or whatever. Um, so, so he so this is it he's talking about it after you've suffered for a while don't worry you know what this is going to do is that it'll bring glory to god and what it'll also do in you is it'll make you perfect meaning mature it will establish you it'll strengthen you it'll settle you i'm i love being with the lord i mean can't you imagine peter he's writing this can't you imagine him after he finally got it right going, you know, uh, you know, praise God. Let me tell you, he's like talking, let me tell you, after you go through this and then you've come through that, that last time there, you know, at the end of it, that you'll, there will be this thing in you that will establish you, it'll mature you, it'll strengthen you, you'll be settled, you'll be, you won't be flailing around like a fish out of water, you won't be fighting like a, like a ninja trying to get everybody off of you and all this kind of stuff. You'll be able to stand with the crucified through those sufferings. All right, now, what I wanna do is, and I said this uh, many classes back, <clears throat> that um, that Peter got so much of what he says in these books, he got it out of the Psalms, and um, and so what I want to do is uh, we've all, here's one thing we've already done. We determined that in the first chapter when it talked about the salvation of our souls, it was not talking about being saved from hell or being saved from guilt or uh, condemnation or all that kind of stuff. It was talking about saved from our soul exploding and, and flailing and, and arguing or justifying or going into self-pity or all the things that our soul will do to look better or feel better or at least, you know, say, well, this is all unjust. This shouldn't be happening to me. I'm I'm such a good person. <laughs> okay. The Lord, the Lord will be the judge of that. All right. So I want to go to Psalms.
if you will, please. And let's look in Psalm 22. And here's some things we're going to find out um, in Psalm 22. We're going to find out about the roaring lion. We're going to find out about soul salvation, meaning when you're in the sufferings of Christ, you don't give in and, you know, make it personal. And you, you know, you, you don't fall asleep while Jesus is over there praying in the garden. You get up, you go over, you throw your arm around him and I say, I'm with you and, and I'll be with you through the thing. And then you go into the trial and you say, I'm with him. You know, do to me what you want to do. And of course, he was, Peter was the one who was hung upside down on a cross eventually. Okay, well, clearly he got, he, he got it. Okay, there's also going to be false witnesses. There's many different terms in Peter used for these witnesses. Um, but they all are that roaring lion. And then, then there's going to be this, as for me. All this going on, it's a little bit like, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the sun and the sky are Jesus and everything else is just the weather. It talks about all these roaring lions, this soul salvation, these false witness, all this stuff. But as for me, I'm just with the sun and the sky. I'm not all wrapped up in the weather. All right, <clears throat> starting with verse 17. I may tell all, um, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garment among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Okay, so who is this? This is David writing this. Who is this referring to? This is referring to Christ. Who is it referring to in you? It's referring to Christ in you, the lamb in you. This is talking about the cross, but it's not just talking about the cross, cross. It's talking about um, the things that you go through before the cross, all of the judgments and all of the beatings, all of the false accusations and all of the trial. OK, so <clears throat> verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul. Oh, my God. Listen, folks. He's saying, don't be far from me. And we're going, oh, I need to feel your presence. Or I need you to touch me. Or I need you to stop the enemy and deliver, deliver me from the enemy. He says, be not far from me, you who are my strength in this situation. Be not far from me. Um, uh, 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 make haste to help me deliver my soul. Okay. So uh, here he is. He's in this situation, and we're going to see this quite a few times. But we're, we're in this situation um, where the, the soul is, um, uh, they're in the, the sufferings of Christ, and you want to just, you know, blame somebody or get out of it. You want deliverance. But, but the Lord, because this is talking about the Lord, they, they parted my garments. They cast lots. The Lord wasn't asking, get me out of here. And the Lord in David wasn't asking, get me out of here. And the Lord in, you know, the list that I have of you 23 people watching right now are not asking, get me out of this situation. Your need, you know the need. The need is, Lord, deliver my soul. I need soul salvation right now. Uh, save my soul from this. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Okay, what? save me from the lion's mouth, deliver my soul. That's going to always be the theme. That's going to be First Peter's theme. That's going to be uh, the theme of the scriptures that we read here in the Psalms. All right. So I am just having a feeling that I am dumping a whole lot on you. And I know uh, I've got a lot more and I don't want to just keep going. I want it to become precious to you. So could I just ask you that if you would, please, if you get a chance to get a copy of this, that you could re-listen or if it ends up being transcribed, that you could read it carefully 
because I'm obviously I'm excited. I mean, you know, this I spent a long time searching this out and the reward was I was able to see the Lord in a special way. And the special way was the way Peter saw the Lord. He saw the Lord in a special way. And I got to look into Peter's heart and see Jesus, the Jesus that he had, not just Paul's Jesus. And um, so I'm probably talking too fast. And I'm probably thinking that I'm, I, I, I need to get all this said because there's so much more coming. But that's not right. So we will pick this up um, later. And maybe, uh, maybe for homework, and we may not get a chance to go over it in class, but maybe you should go through the Psalms and just check out, uh, you know, the Save My Soul and uh, the, the Lion and um, those, just those kind of simple things and see exactly what's going on. Obviously, this has to do with the cross because it's quoting stuff that happened to Jesus on the cross and before the cross, you know. I mean, the judgments and the treatment and the taking of his garments and the, you know, stripping him basically naked and hanging him out open, all this kind of stuff. And, um, and so we're hearing, we're not just hearing a psalm. We're not just hearing something foreign to First Peter. We're hearing from the crucified himself. But then Peter never got it at the cross and denied the Lord three times rather harshly with language that wasn't very good. But then sometime later he's reading the Psalms and he gets it. And so he's using the same examples going on here. He's using the example of the lion and the soul that needs saving because, you know, Probably in his heart, he thought when he was denying the Lord, man, and he said, I, I will die for you. Remember that? So many times stuff was happening. And, and when, the, when the crunch came, he did. He, he, he did. He denied the Lord, and he denied him three times. And in one account, it was to three different people. And so now he's seeing the same crucified. He's seeing him in the Psalms, and he's using Psalm examples to build his case because when he saw it all of a sudden he saw what the problem was the problem wasn't the the people who were asking me the problem wasn't you know the devil the problem wasn't you know all these things the problem was my soul i i quivered under the pressure of it and I wasn't with Jesus when he needed me to be with him. And can you hear Peter saying that and going, and that's not going to happen ever again. And I don't know the examples that came up when they hung him upside down on the cross. But beforehand, they probably said, you know, we're going to hang you on a cross, too, if you don't deny him or something like that. And he said, I'm not worthy to be hung on a cross like Jesus. Hang me upside down. I'm, I'm just with the Lord. You know, but I'm not that with the Lord. It's his life, his nature, not me. So, um, so we'll, we'll come back to this uh, next Wednesday night. Let's pray. Lord, forgive me if I'm so excited or so talking so fast or I just desire so much that they get it. And I know that through those things, that's not going to be the way. So I simply agree with your spirit that you can take the things that have been shared. And maybe if they do get a chance to re-listen or re-read this, your spirit can be upon that. You can show them that it is clear cut patterns over and over in first peter and that he got them clearly after we get through with all of the angles how many of them came out of the psalms that he saw jesus that he, he saw christ crucified so father i pray you'll bless them and they love you they're they're here in this this 
class, although it's not a class to almost all of them. It is a place that they come and say, I want you, Jesus. So I just pray that you'll fulfill their desire and their hunger and that you will open First Peter to them, that you'll open Psalms to them, that you'll open your heart to them and let them see these things as they are eternally, as the gold standard of your heart. Father, I ask it not in my name or my goodness or my ability to make it clear. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.